Hello, everyone. Does anyone here actually enjoy using C? Yeah, quite a few hands going up. Awesome. There's a, this, this talk's for you. I, I really like C. It, um, it's so simple and it's just so delightfully accommodating when you want to do something terrible. <laughs> All right. My name is Tom, as uh, Vicky kindly introduced me. I yep, work for Aztec Labs in Hobart. Today I'm going to be talking about using C libraries, uh, like third party C libraries inside uh, iOS apps. This year I've been working on a project at work to use the open source PDF library, PDFium, and include it in our main app, Aztec Docs. This talk's going to be a bit more general than that, hopefully giving you some tips so you can go from downloading a tarball to using a library inside your own app. But I'm going to draw on a lot of the techniques and uh, things we learnt from the PDFium experience. So this talk's going to be roughly in three parts. There's, we're going to talk first about a little bit about Aztec Docs and PDFium and why it was that we made the decision to use an app in the, uh, sorry, a library in the first place that wasn't necessarily designed for iOS. Then I'm going to segue into a bit about how we organised our code, so the way we included the C code inside our Xcode project and gained some code quality improvements along the way. Then after that I'm going to pop out of Keynote, hop into Xcode and show you some real demonstrations of how you can grab C code and put it inside your project and configure it in ways that uh, you can use yourself. So very briefly, for those who are not familiar with Aztec Docs, the one set in summary is this. You've got, the, our customers have a server that links up to their document repositories and then those documents are pushed down to mobile devices where users can view and edit them. That is the, that is the crux of the app. So clearly one of the key requirements for us is that all the important kinds of documents render really well. So we're talking about things like office documents and PDFs and images and so on, all the things that people are likely to find on their corporate networks. So the way we accomplish that varies from platform to platform. For this talk, we're going to be focusing on iOS and PDF files in particular. So until now, we've been using the Core Graphics PDF rendering functions, which you may be familiar with. They're built into iOS. They let you uh, take PDFs and put them on screen. However, there are some problems with the Core Graphics PDFs. Here is a random PDF I found. It may be familiar to some of you. This is opened up in OS X Preview. And in this case, the user has gone wild with the OS X annotation functions, covered it in arrows and speech bubbles and highlights and so on. And this edits the PDF file. So there's extra objects contained in the file that weren't there before. And in this case, suppose the user takes that annotated file and decides to put it on the network somewhere where it's picked up by Aztec Docs and then synchronized to their device. Until now, the annotated file comes up like this. Obviously, that's pretty disappointing for the user. They would really like to have those annotations, and this has been a, you know, a fairly long-standing issue for us, so we decided, right, that's enough of that. Time to actually do something about this and come up with a way that users can have their annotations too. So I quickly realised this wasn't going to be easily possible using the stuff built into iOS, so I started searching for libraries to help me out. Now, as soon as you start Googling for PDF libraries, the first thing that comes up is all the Ubuid proprietary options. These companies that you know, make these widgets that are designed for iOS, they come with wonderful script and Objective-C APIs, and they say, yeah, we do all the annotations, you can have all the features in the world, and yeah, you just have to give us a lot of money and everything will be great. So they are often expensive, but you get this commercial support, but they also have a lot of, a lot of potential downsides as well. You know, everyone has bugs in their software when the new version of iOS comes out. And if you're relying on some statically built library or a lot of statically built libraries, then it's possible that you won't be able to get your app store into, uh, sorry, your app into the app store in time for release because you're being held up by uh, companies that you have no control over. Also, if your customers come to you and say, can we, we, we would really like to have this feature, can you do that for us? And if our libraries don't permit us to use that feature and they're not interested in putting it in for us, then well, we're sort of stuck in between a rock and a hard place. So being able to have access to the source code and be able, being able to modify it's really useful to us. Also, the way that some libraries enforce their licensing can be a challenge. For example, 
including bundle identifiers baked into the static library can mean that if you, for some deployment reason, want to use a different bundle ID, that, well, suddenly that library doesn't work anymore. So I came across PDFium, which was originally by Foxit Software. You're probably familiar with their PDF tools. Um, this particular release was, as far as I can tell, purchased by Google and then released as an open source project under a permissive license. I believe they use it inside Chrome to do the PDF rendering there. It's not specifically an iOS project, but um, it can be built for iOS without too much trouble. Um, so I built a test app, put it through all its paces, and we found that it actually renders all of the annotations we need really well. It has a bunch of other features which we never even thought about adding, like um, I, don't, I didn't even realise this until I was working on it, PDFs with these crazy forms in them, and you can tell it, oh, the user tapped at this XY location and it does some stuff and says, we should go to this page number now. And I say, yeah, OK, we'll go to that page number now. And it just does it all by itself. PDFs are terrifying. Anyway, it supports all that. And the thing that's interesting about it is that it's written in C++, though the public API that you interact with from your application is in C. So right off the bat, we knew that this was going to be a, a bit of an integration challenge for us because we would have to work with C, not as fast and easy to use. But on the other hand, C is also very interesting to us. We have cross-platform clients. We've got iOS, Android, Windows, Mac. And having a library that's in C sort of opens the possibility to us of being able to use the same library on multiple platforms, which means we can possibly share code and at least share our knowledge across the platforms, which saves us a bunch of effort. So that's quite interesting. So put all that together, and it's not on the App Store yet, but the end result has been really pleasing. This is the current development build. As you can see, it's now rendering that annotated PDF correctly. So on the whole, this has been a good experience for us. And I guess the, the key takeaway from this section is don't be afraid to look for sort of generic C libraries to solve your business problems. It doesn't necessarily have to be something you find on CocoaPods or um, something IELTS specific because there's a, there's a lot of high quality C code out there that you can use. So now I'm going to talk a bit about how we actually included PDFEM Swift inside our project, which is uh, several years old now, quite large, quite complex. And we didn't want to make a mess in the process. Uh, until now, like I said, we'd been using Core Graphics. And you're probably aware that Core Graphics is itself a C API. Um, and we'd ended up using a lot of C code directly inside our view controllers, which was probably a good idea at the time, but over time it become somewhat unmanageable as we increase the number of features in the application. And we were keen to replace this with a, a more object-oriented solution. And weirdly enough, moving to an alternative C library gave us the opportunity to introduce some object orientation. And I'll explain how. The way we organised it in the end was using a framework, a new target inside our workspace, which we called PDFEM Swift. And this contained both all of the PDFEM code that we were using and also a bunch of new Swift classes that we wrote ourselves, wrapper objects that went around the C code. This Swift, these Swift wrappers are a complete wall between the C code and our application code, which means that we don't use any of the C types or C uh, functions directly in our application, which allows everything to be neatly compartmentalised and improves the quality of code quite a lot. So some of the, to give you an idea, these are some of the types of wrapper classes that we're implementing. These are sort of inspired by the types of handles that you get from PDFium when you're interacting with the C library, but they're also informed and influenced by the way we know we use PDFs inside our app. So if we've got a particular part of our user interface that's expecting a certain data type then we'll, so we'll come up with an object that we can just neatly pass to that to get its job done. Now, you're probably, if you've used C libraries before, you're probably familiar with the process that, OK, if we, if we want to sort of get some resource and work with it, you have the, the sort of initialize or allocate stage. Let's get a handle to this thing. And then we'll do a bunch of work on it, a bunch of function calls passing in the handle. And then when you're done with it, you must pass it to the release or deallocate function or close function. You've got to give it the opportunity to tidy up so that you don't leak memory and um, basically to keep everything working nicely. So 
that's even slightly more complicated in the case of PDFium because these objects in this order form a bit of a hierarchy. You have to open your document and then you use your document handle to get your page, then you use your page handle to get your page text, and you have to ensure that you then release these in the opposite order that you got them out. So on the face of it, this could potentially be quite challenging if you're building sort of an interactive uh, app with user trying to do all kinds of things and background threads and whatnot, and you need to make sure you do all this cleanup in the right order exactly once without any leaks. Swift actually made this um, relatively painless for us. So to get into the top level of the hierarchy, we need to get a document first. So the way we did this is the PDF document wrapper has a couple of uh, factory methods on it, static functions, where we pass in some Swift type as the parameter of file name or a, a custom data accessor, and it will return a PDF object. And then once we have an instance of the PDF object, we can request a page, and that will return a page object, which is wrapping under the hood one of those PDFEM uh, page handles. Digging into that, the that get page function, I've taken out a bunch of error handling and so on, it's a, so it's grabbing the handle and then it's creating a new wrapper object and you, now you've got your PDF page, which is a Swift object. And then we use the dinit method to clean up the C resource, which means that we're relying on the Swift reference counting to automatically clean up our C resources when the PDF page is no longer in use. Now you'll notice that in this example there's also a document. That's the parent document that this PDF page came from. We're passing it in when we create the PDF page wrapper and we're kneeling it out in the, the init. So we've got this challenge that we've got all of these PDF pages and okay, so suppose the user opens up a document and one of the pages is currently rendering and then they decide to close the document. So the view, view controller is cleared for memory, it's uh, no longer got a reference to the PDF document and it might be possible that the PDF document tries to close then and there. It gets de-initted, it calls uh, FPDF close, close document and that causes all kinds of problems for the page that is still rendering because suddenly it's lost the memory that it was in the middle of doing a render on. So what we did is made all of the subordinate resources have strong references to their parent objects, meaning that um, each one of these pages has to finish doing what it was already doing and then they'll get to deinitialize, and then the document will get to deinitialize, and that gives us the guarantee that all of the resources will be deallocated de in the correct order. And because we're just sort of using Swift objects in the usual way, it's quite unlikely that we're going to have a memory leak. Uh, we just have to sort of make sure we don't create any reference loops and suddenly we have the ability to do asynchronous operations, put things onto threads, we can use closures and it just works. We don't, we don't have any of that pain that you would usually expect from a, a C library. I mentioned before that we were using, uh, it's quite interesting for us to have C as a library because it allows us to potentially use it across multiple clients. Uh, it's for that reason that we have a bunch of shared code uh, in our application that's written in C++ because that uh, was compatible with all of our clients. And that meant that a lot of our view controllers are written in Objective C++, .mm, uh, sorry, .mm files so that they can interact with both the Objective C APIs of the platform and also the C++ code that is shared. So what this means now is that if you open a PDF document on the new version, uh, which is using PDFium, you've got four languages working together simultaneously to get this document onto the screen. On the face of it, that might be kind of scary, but it also puts us in a surprisingly good place from a software maintainability point of view. So as I mentioned before, this project's several years old, it's quite large, and we were interested in increasing the proportion of Swift code that we're using inside our project. Um, it, as a, a result of taking the Core Graphics C API and replacing it with the Swift wrappers meant that we were able to factor out a lot of the Objective-C code in our view controllers and turn it into pure Swift, interacting with other pure Swift, which means that the total amount of Objective-C++ has decreased and the total amount of Swift has increased. It's very cool for us to be able to uh, incrementally 
make those changes and increase the amount of SWIFT in our code without having to do some massive breaking change, which is a real challenge when you've got a product of this size and age. So I'm going to stop using Keynote for a minute and I'm going to take you through some demonstrations in Xcode that uh, will hopefully let you use some of these techniques yourself. This is our first demo project. It is a simple brand new iOS uh, single view app that is written in Swift. And I have here one of the simplest C libraries in existence. It contains a .h file and a .c file. So I'm going to take those guys and I'm going to drag them straight into the project. And I'm going to copy them in. Now Xcode's going to ask me, do I want to create a bridging header? That's going to turn out to be important. I'll say yes. I'll point that out in a moment. So let's have a look at these files that were just added. First we have a header file. It says we have a function that will print anvil, whatever that means. We can see that Xcode has detected that this is a C header type and it's not a member of a target. That's a typical feature of C headers. You want to make sure that that gets done right. The C file, it has figured out, is C source and it is a member of our application target. So it's going to be part of the same executable unit as, the, as our Swift code. And as you can probably tell from my highly obfuscated source code, that's going to print an anvil. So with that in place, it's right there in our project. Let's say, all right, view did load. Print anvil, run. Oops, that's not going to work. We don't have, it can't find the print anvil thing. And the reason that's happening is because uh, C types are not bridged to Swift automatically. We have to tell it which symbols should be available. So let's have a look down here on the left at direct bridging header.h. This is the file that uh, Xcode created automatically for me when I said yes to the earlier dialog box. Let's have a look inside that. Use this file to import your target's public headers that you would like to expose to Swift. That sounds like exactly what I want to do. What's going on here? Here we go. Import simple.h build. Build succeeded. Now I'm going to run that and we'll see that it works. Let's see if anyone's awake. What a, I'm building for the iPhone 4 simulator here. What, what architecture is that? compiling my C code to on my laptop right now. Anyone know? 4S. What was that, sorry? The, the 4S? Yeah, the 4S simulator. ARMv7. X86. It, X86 is right, because it's a simulator, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I asked if, <laughs> if we were awake. So now the, the, the reason I point that out is that this is a, um, this didn't ask me for that. One of the cool things about including C code directly in your Xcode project is that it takes care of all the architecture rubbish for you. You don't have to think about it. And we can see here that it has in fact printed out the anvil to the console. So that's really good. Let's pop back to the slideshow for a second. To recap, I just added some C code directly to the project. It was really easy. All I had to do was add an import, boom, call the function, we're done. So if you've got just small snippets of C code that you want to use, this is probably the best way to go about it. However, if you um, have large amounts of code or code from multiple sources, they might conflict with each other. Uh, if you create Swift wrappers, you might find that they uh, are tightly coupled to your project. There's no real separation. It's all part of your app when you do it this way. So with those caveats in mind, let's have a look at a more sophisticated way of including C inside your Xcode project. Now this example uses a real life third-party C library that I found on the internet called libzip. You may have used it before. It's simply a C library that lets you open and interact with uh, zip files. And in this case, I'm using a different target in the project. You can see the two targets here, and the type of target I'm using is a framework, which is a really useful target for separating code and creating a sort of a separate module that you can uh, reuse in different projects. So let's have a look at how that happens. Inside the build phases section of the, um, of the target here, we can see that all the C files have been put into their own target. And there's even more separation going on with the header files. 
In this top section, we have the external files. Uh, these are the ones which are potentially going to be available to Swift. And down here we have the project files. These are the ones which are only going to be accessible to the C inside the framework. So you can see that we're not only separating the C code from the rest of the application, we're also drawing a line and saying, okay, these header files are the ones which we want to make available to the app, and these header files just contain internal stuff that we're not interested in using just at the moment. Excuse me. So that's how the C is divvied up. If we look down inside here, you'll notice that there's also a bit of Swift code hiding inside the framework. It's this class called zip count. Simply by using the public keyword on the Swift class and on the Swift function, that says this is a public bit of code. Even though we're inside a framework, this function and this class should be available to any other target that imports this framework. So what that means is inside here, we can use the zip functions, zip open, zip get num entries, and the resulting function is just a simple Swift one. We pass in the path as a string and we get back an integer. Now let's have a look at what that looks like in our main app. We get, an app, we get a path as a string, we use our zip function, and there's no C anywhere to be seen. So this is a really clean way to take a C library, put some Swift around it, and then use that, C, uh, sorry, use that code inside your main app without leaking any of the real implementation details. There's another trick going on here. You might notice if I try to use zip open here, I can't, it doesn't exist. I'm, I've got two different imports going on. I've got an import my zip, which I'm using inside the application. This only gives access to the Swift classes. But inside the Swift wrapper, inside the framework, I'm importing a different thing called my zip internal. And that one does give access to the C classes. And the way that that's done is using this extra file hiding down here, a module map. I've defined two different framework modules. One of them is called myzip and the other one's called myzip internal. One of them includes the header file that uh, ex includes all of the C functions and C types that we want to include. The other one, myzip, doesn't include any of the C stuff. So if we want to have access to the C stuff, we, include, we import the internal one. If we just want to use our uh, wrappers, we use the myzip one. So that gives us even better separation between those uh, sections of our framework. So to wrap up what that, what that example was, we're now using Swift only in our interface and we've got separation uh, completely between the C code and the main app. And you can see that this creates a reusable package. You can take this framework and you can use it in another project. You can give it its own unit test suite. Um, it's a much more convenient way of taking your C code and using it. The downside is that you actually had to write those wrappers. The good thing is that you got to write those wrappers, which means you got to do them exactly the way you wanted um, and you have exactly the interface you needed for your, to meet your application's needs. Now, in the final example, we're going to go to PDFEM itself. If you get the PDFEM uh, repository, what you find is it has a build script that will generate an Xcode project for you, and it's kind of terrifying. It has a lot of targets producing static libraries, and if you click on this menu up here, it doesn't even fit on my screen. Um, multiple sub-projects and all the rest of it. Scary as it looks, if you take this and you put it inside a workspace, and you add an iOS project, and you make your iOS project uh, depend on these libraries, you can uh, then include the header files and start using the PDF EMC functions. That works perfectly well. But we looked at this and we're like, nah, I don't really want that much clutter in the main project. And, you know, we want to get that, we want to sort of take all of it and hide it inside a single framework. That would be a bit neater. Also, there's the problem that if you want to do a, a clean build, you're going to be building all the PDFEM all the time. And, it, you know, if you're doing a continuous integration build, you do want to do a clean build just to make sure that there's no cruft stuffing every, anything up. So. It's, um, we, weren't, we weren't too keen on having that there. So what we did was we compiled all of these PDFEM targets to static libraries, .a files. We did it in two ways. We created one set of .a files which contained the 
uh, 32-bit and 64-bit ARM, and then another set of files which contain the 32-bit and 64-bit um, Intel sets. They are, as of Xcode 7, they have to be separate. And uh, we, all, all of our developers, simply have a copy of those .a files on disk, which we then reference from the main project. So let's have a look at PDFEM Swift, which is the overall framework that I was talking about before. Here's PDFEM Swift, and these are the these are the linker settings that we've used. Down here, you can see that the library search paths are specially configured. I've got two folders on my hard drive here. One of them is called x86, and the other one's called ARM. And which one we're using is specially configured depending on whether we're using the simulator, i.e., we need the x86 ones, or whether we're using an actual IOS device. In other words, we need the ARM ones. Then, to make sure that it can actually find the symbols, we set some custom linker flags to say, right, we need to include begin, FDRM, form filler, and so on, all of these libraries that are actually required. Then, there are two things you need together. You need the .a files, and then you need the header files, the .h files, to say what those functions are. So those are all included in the project too. Then we have all of our um, Swift files, our wrappers that I was telling you about earlier. So this is one of them. And you can see here, using the same trick that was uh, being used in the zip example, we've got an internal import here to give access to the C functions. What does all this mean when we put it together? Here is a brand new IOS app. I've, I've decided, right, I wanted to render a PDF using PDFEM Swift. All I had to do was link it with the PDFEM Swift framework, make sure it's embedded in the binary. Now, over in my view controller, I import it, and that's it. Now, inside my viewdid load, I can get my path as a string. I can use the PDF document static method, the factory method that I was telling you about before, get the page, set up a render, and when the render finishes, I'll uh, put it inside an image view. So I'll get that running. One cool thing about using uh, Swift as the wrappers is that it has access to UI kits, so there's no reason why we can't use things like UI images inside our API. So here we have a, a, a function on our PDF page that yeah, that gives us a closure that gets a UI image in its, uh, in its uh, callback. And there we are, we ran it. And a very simple application with not very much code is suddenly able to take advantage of this uh, C library without actually needing to use any C itself. So this final example was showing you one way that you can deal with taking a whole bunch of targets and put them into a single framework to reduce the amount of noise, and also how we manage to um, avoid increasing the length of our builds by uh, using static libraries that were already pre-compiled at the expense of a bit of extra complexity in our build process. I said before that if you include it directly, Xcode takes care of the architecture for you. That is no longer the case here. So we come to the end. These are the takeaway points I hope you find useful. There are some cool C libraries out there. Don't be afraid to go looking for them and use them. Swift is really quite good at working with C. Um, you can use uh, Swift to write your own object-oriented wrappers, and the results can be quite good. And I've shown you three different ways. You don't have to use any of them, but hopefully it gives you a bit of an insight into how, it, how the options you have at your disposal to um, incorporate C code into your Xcode project cleanly. That's about all for me. Thank you all for coming along.